Okay, welcome to another You Can Do the DNA Lecture. This is part two in our four-part series. This one is going to be all about those ethnicity results. So, first of all, I want to talk about this principle that you are 100% you. Now, I know this might seem a little bit obvious at first. Of course you are. But think of it from a genetic standpoint. You are literally the only one of you. You're the only one who looks genetically just like you do, the only one who has ever lived, and the only one who will ever live who has your exact genetic record. Isn't that pretty amazing? And doesn't that make it worthwhile to capture and document that record so that future generations will know and understand exactly who you were genetically? So I believe in this principle so much that I made a t-shirt <laughs> out of it, actually. And so I, I just love this idea that not only are you 100% you, but you are made up of 50% of your parents, 25% of your grandparents, 12% of your great-great-grandparents, and so on. And what a beautiful legacy, really, each of us is because of this amazing thing we call DNA. But as amazing as DNA is, why is it that we're letting it define who we are? Ever since DNA testing really became part of it, a global product in the global market, so this year we're celebrating 25 years of genetic genealogy, but really it's only been in kind of mainstream popularity maybe for the last, say, 10, maybe 15 years. But ever since then, it has become a global phenomenon. If you go to YouTube and you Google DNA test result reveal, you get hundreds of videos of regular people. And when I say regular people, I mean these aren't even genealogists. These are just regular people who take a DNA test and they have these kinds of reactions when they open their ethnicity results. They are flabbergasted, blown away by what their DNA says they are. Now my grandmother, isn't she beautiful? Just lo I love this picture of her. So my grandmother was very proud of her origins. And she would talk about her origins to anybody around her, even though she wasn't even a genealogist. She didn't need to be, you see. She knew who her people were. So my grandmother was half Welsh and half Italian. You could say she is the product of a great American love story. So her parents grew up in their home countries and actually met and married here in the United States. And so while she did identify as Welsh, her heart was in Italy. So her family was from Traversella, Italy. And if you asked her about it, she would tell you Traversella is way up in the Alps. And the reason that she was more identifying with her Italian side is because her grandmother was the one who brought her mother over from, uh, from Italy. And her grandmother lived just down the street, and my grandmother spent every single day with her grandmother speaking Italian. In fact, my grandmother remembers one argument between her parents growing up, and it was because her father was telling her mother that it was time that she spoke English, because she only spoke Italian. And so my grandma identified so fully with the Italian part of her, even though she was also half Welsh, right? Now, in the early days of ethnicity testing, sometimes we call it biogeographical testing. There are a lot of names we call it. I'm just going to refer to it as ethnicity, as I think that's the most colloquial term. But back in 2007, the first autosomal DNA test was launched. Now, autosomal just means you get the DNA from both sides of your family. And the DNA testing companies were able to tell us if we were part of one of these three categories. You could be European, Asian, or African. And we were so impressed. We were like, 
oh my gosh, how did they know that about me? I'm 100% European, crazy. We were just over the moon. And now we're nitpicky, right? We're like, they totally underestimated my Irish. This is not right. Okay, so I just want you to recognize how far we've come in this really short timeline. We now have five DNA testing companies willing to offer you their estimate of your ethnicity. And make sure you're hearing that word. It is an estimate. It's not meant to be exact. They know it's not exact. This is an estimate of your heritage. So I want to talk about two different kinds of ethnicity results that are currently available from our DNA testing companies or from some of our DNA testing companies. So let's talk first about the then results, the kinds of results we get from our ethnicity that tell us about our ancestors a very, very long time ago. These ethnicity results reflect your heritage maybe 2,000, 3,000 years ago. They look like this, very familiar to us. It's the map with all of the percentages. But again, it's important to understand that these maps and percentages aren't supposed to reflect your very recent heritage. They may, but some of the locations definitely represent very deep ancestral locations that you may never find on a document or be able to put on your family tree. So to understand these results, we are going to talk about the science of them. Isn't that fun? Yes. Okay, I promise it'll be fun. I promise. And then we're talking about the application of these kinds of results. So let's talk first about the science of it. Now I'm going to give you kind of an overview of the science. If you really like science, I encourage you to go out to our blog. So it's yourdnaguide.com slash ydgblog, and there's a search box right at the top, and put in the name Janie. So Janie and I have been friends since college, and uh, she's the smart one, okay? So I've ax asked her to write all of these really awesome, scientifically-based articles about your ethnicity results. So if you're interested, I encourage you to go out and read Janie's full articles on these subjects. But for now, we're going to discuss two aspects of the science reference populations, and what I call fancy math. So let's start with reference populations. So the thing about reference populations is that each of our companies is using different reference populations. These are the people they're comparing you against. So if your heritage is from Croatia, for example, but our DNA testing company does not have a Croatian reference population, Will they be able to tell you you're from Croatia? No. But the thing is, they're not going to say, huh, I, I don't know where you're from, because that would be a bad product, right, in their mind. It would be better for us. But they're not going to say that. Instead, they're going to say you're from somewhere else. But you're not, right? So it's really important to understand the available reference populations at our DNA testing companies, and I've put a link to that in the handout, which you can get through the app, so that you can kind of dig deeper into the different reference populations. I'm going to give you an overview, just a very general overview. In general, family tree DNA is breaking up the world into a few reference populations. In general, these are broad, and you can see my circles, they're kind of representing these different places. And so, in general, these reference populations are not going to be specific. They are going to tell you about an area where you may be from. Now, this is opposed to living DNA, which is a DNA testing company really hyper-focused on the UK. They have uh, like 50 populations just in the UK. So if you have UK ancestry, sometimes it can be really valuable to test with living DNA and get that more distilled breakdown of your heritage from them. Then we move out to ancestry, my heritage, 23andMe. They have many more reference populations. 
but they're very similar to each other in the number of reference populations. But it's important that even though my, these three companies have a similar number of total reference populations, they're still different. And they're talking about these populations differently. The names of the locations are different. It doesn't mean you're different. So oftentimes you'll see one company defining an area of um, Central Europe, for example, and you'll think, well, that's not where I'm from, because those words that they use to describe that area don't resonate with you. So make sure you're looking at the map and understanding the section of the world they're actually talking about. Most of the time you'll find that all the companies are actually talking about the same piece of land. They're just naming it differently. So pay attention to the map as well as the actual names of the categories. So that's the first thing, is reference populations. They make a huge difference in what the company's able to tell you about you. The second is fancy math. So we're gonna talk recall and precision. So the goal of this kind of math is to find everyone in the database that belongs in this specific category. So pretty simple goal, but it requires some really hefty math. So let's talk about recall and precision. Let's say that these flags all represent individuals in their database that are actually from these two countries, Ireland and Italy. Now, first of all, take a look at these flags and think of how they represent the genetics of these people. These flags look really similar. <laughs> Now, if you would have asked any of us, do you think people from Italy and people from Ireland are similar? You'd say, no. <laughs> their culture is different, their language is different, their food is different, everything seems different to us. But genetically, they are so similar. We are all so similar that even the fact that we can even attempt to siphon off Irish people from Italian people using our genetics is amazing. So please, again, don't lose the magic of this technology. It's incredible that we can do this at all. Okay, so let's talk recall. So recall, the goal of recall is to get everybody in the database back to their home countries. Okay, so if we're talking recall and we want to, to look at our data set, High recall would be where everybody gets back to their home country. Does that make sense? So they put out this mathematical signal that goes into their database and pulls out of it only people that belong in Ireland and people that belong in Italy. So low recall is what I've shown here actually, sorry. Low recall is where some people made it back to their home country, but not everyone, right? So high recall is when almost everyone or everyone makes it back to their home country, okay? But we have to balance that with precision. So think of precision like a pool, and you're peering into that pool and asking, is everybody in that pool from the same place? When you have high precision, Everybody's from the same place. You're looking in the Irish pool and everybody's from Ireland. Low precision is where there's people from other countries that got told they were from Ireland. Okay, so you have to balance these two principles. You have to balance recall and precision. If one is too high, the other gets really low. Okay, so it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. It's, it's a difficult balance that these companies are trying to make. And so you have to understand that they're doing their best, but sometimes you're getting recalled to the wrong country. Okay? So we have some clues from some of our companies about these recall and precision practices. So at Ancestry DNA, if you click on any major category in your ethnicity results. So here I've clicked on Germanic Europe. You'll get this kind of detailed view of Germanic Europe. 
And you can see right below the title, there's that 8%. I'm 8% Germanic Europe. If you click on that 0 to 39%, or you click on that, I'm sorry, learn more about this map and ethnicity, it pulls up some information about recall and precision. But of course, they don't use those words because they're not into fancy math like we are. They want to make it easy for you. But essentially, they're showing you this map. And let me tell you what this map means. So that lighter blue right there in the center of Germany, it's telling you that 50 to 75% of people who live in that blue area, that light blue area, so they are actually in Germany, probably from there for generations, they are only getting recalled to this location 50 to 75% of the time. Okay, so these are like real true blue Germans. They're not us mixed Americans, okay? But even then, they're not being recalled 100% of the time. Now, if you move out from Germany, that kind of darker circle, these are people who aren't actually German, right? They're from Belgium and the Netherlands. These people are being recalled into the German category 25 to 50% of the time. So do you see what they're trying to tell you? They're saying, hey, guys, this category is tricky. Okay, we're going to bring people into the German category that are Belgian, that are Dutch, and there are going to be people who belong in the German category that we didn't recall. We're telling them they're from somewhere else. Okay? Make sense? Clear as mud? Great. Okay, so that's the background that I hope that you kind of gather at least a little bit so that you can get a feel for this technology and how it works and how sometimes it doesn't work and how they're trying to get better at it. So every time you get an update in your results, it's because they've either increased or modified their reference populations, or they've modified this fancy math, theoretically, for the better, right? So to help us really drill down this principle in a less sciencey way for all of you who are like, I cannot believe I just sat through five minutes of recall and precision, we are going to play Name That State. Are you ready? Okay, so what's going to happen, I'm going to give you a set of traits, and I want you to guess the state, the U.S. state. Sorry for all of you who are international. It'll still be fun, maybe. Okay, here we go. What if I gave you a football? What state would you give me? Nebraska, Alabama, Georgia, Texas, Oklahoma. We have a lot of football fans in here. Okay, so who's right? Everybody thinks they're right, of course. One data point, one broad data point, just not enough, right? What if I added an additional data point? Massachusetts, I hear. Who else? Indiana? Chicago? Okay, but do you see how just one extra data point narrowed our search? It couldn't be all of those places because we added one extra data point. And this is something that our companies are doing. They're creating these kind of clusters of genetic data points that define specific populations. But in the end, even though this data point could be assigned to multiple states, the company has to make a decision. They have to call it. And so we're doing fine in Irish, Notre Dame. Now, is that going to be the same for every Irish football fan? No, but will it en encompass maybe a majority of Irish football fans? Maybe, right? That's what they're hoping. That's what the estimate is meant to do. It's meant to capture the majority of situations, but not 100% of them. Okay, let's try another one. Rain. <laughs> Washington, Florida. Yeah, there's some pretty rainy states, right? Okay, what if I add recycling? Okay, I'm here in Washington and Oregon. What if I added a third data point? Organic blueberries. 
Okay, if you can't hear in your house, we went from kind of Washington, Oregon, some kind of Northwest theme to almost everybody by three data points saying Oregon. Isn't that incredible how just adding that third data point helped us narrow down this location to something much more specific? Now, I've played this game in several areas across the US, and in general, when I'm in the West, the answer from the crowd is Oregon. When I'm in the East, it's not. Somebody said it, Maine? Maine, Vermont. And me, I'm from the Northwest. I thought this was obvious, Oregon. Okay, but as soon as I went to the East Coast, no one thought of Oregon. They all thought of their own, their own state with these characteristics. So the bias that can sometimes be introduced into data because of the data you've already collected. Does that make sense? So if you have a ton of people from, north, the, from the Northwest in your data set, your data set will be biased towards the Northwest. So companies have to watch out for these biases as they're calculating all of this data and be careful to not weight the data in one way or another. All right, one, so yeah, that was the other answer. One more. Sunshine. Florida, Arizona. Hawaii, California. Definitely. What else I've got for you? A surfboard. Hawaii, California, Florida. What if I add one more? Ah, uh, see, everybody initially says California, and then they remember, oh, there's another Disney, right? So what do we do here? These three seem to really match two places, right? We've got California and it could easily be argued Florida as well. This is also a problem that our companies have. The data isn't clear. There are actually two really strong pulls towards two kind of different places. So a lot of times what the company does then is it gives you some very broad category like Northwestern Europe. <laughs> okay, and you're like, that's not helpful. But this is what's happening. They're seeing this in the data. They see your data pulled into these different regions, and they can't call it. They aren't confident in giving you something more specific, so they're like broadly Northwestern European. Okay, did that help? Was that fun? States and traits? Okay, now that we're done with the science, and I hope you really feel confident in your understanding of what's going on in the back end, Let's talk about application. How do we actually use this information in our family history? So we're gonna do three things. We're gonna explore a side view, I'm gonna give you a tip about endogamy, and we're gonna divide it up. So, exploring side view. So, the side view technology and ancestry DNA is meant to help you determine which ethnicities you received from your mother and which you received from your father. So this is now uh, part of a subscription program at Ancestry. So if you can't see this, it's probably because you don't have a subscription. But what happens is you come to this page and they tell you maternal and paternal. Well, actually they tell you parent one and parent two. You have to assign which is maternal and which is paternal. Ancestry cannot tell. They can't tell. You have to tell them based on what you know about your parents, which is which. Okay, so once you do that, you'll have that maternal and paternal, and then you can explore the ethnicity that's going on here. So I could click, for example, on Sweden and Denmark, and I could see that all of my Swedish and Danish DNA is coming from my dad. Okay, so you can see the applications of this in your own family history research. If you have some kind of rogue ethnicity, you're like, I have no idea where this came from, you can come to this tool and click on it and at least know if it came from your dad's side or your mom's side, which may help move you forward in investigating that ethnicity. So 
Endogamy is tricky, right? And a lot of things that we teach in family history and DNA is to group your matches, which we'll talk about this afternoon. It's difficult to do that with endogamy. But we're still needing to find the matches that are best, that we need to investigate first. And so you can do that by looking at your ethnicity compared to another person. So this one's at Ancestry, and I've just clicked on a match named Olivia, and then I'm clicking on that middle um, menu item called Ethnicity. So when I look at it, I can see that this, um, this individual has 90, what does that say, 98% Swedish, and I have this little section. So if I'm researching my Swedish ancestry, I'm looking for people who are from Sweden. So you might think initially, this is a great match because this person is obviously from the country that I'm trying to research. And they might be, but in a lot of populations, uh, small towns, especially Nordic small towns, there is a lot of endogamy. And so sifting out which of this person's lines is related to you versus just to each other, it can get really messy and difficult. And so while it might seem obvious that this is the person you'd want to choose to help you discover that Swedish heritage, I think a better choice is actually someone like this. Another person who has a small amount of Swedish ancestry. So theoretically, you would notice this about their ethnicity, then you would go into their family tree and see if they've already identified their Swedish line. If they have, you know that that's a good opportunity for you to just take a look and see if their Swedish families are maybe in the same areas as yours. And perhaps that is the line you could investigate as far as your relationship. So again, with endogamy, you kind of want to stay away from people who are fully a part of the community that you're trying to connect to, uh, just because it makes it a little bit easier to decide which branch of their family you might belong to. So you can do a similar process at Family Tree DNA. You can click on the My Origin section, which shows you your own ethnicity results, and then they have a little compare origins, and you can see other people's shared heritage compared to yours. So we did the endogamy tip, and we did the side view. The next thing to do is to divide it up. So we talked about this a little bit yesterday in my first lecture, and we talked about it a little bit just at the beginning, how you have 50% from your parents, you have 25% from your grandparents, 12%, and so on and so on. And so in my workbook, I actually help you like walk through catalog cataloging those percentages so you can kind of guess at which percentages may have come from which kinds of ancestors, which could help you in the long run. So that was our science lesson and our application for our then results. Now let's move on to our now results. So this is a relatively recent innovation from our DNA testing companies, only in the last five years or so. Have they been able to move our ethnicity estimates to a range of years that's really valuable for genealogy? So we're going to talk about the science of this because it's different than the science of our then technology, and then we'll talk about application. So first of all, the science. The science is based on DNA matches. Okay, remember before, it's based on reference populations and fancy math. So this is match-based technology that gives us these genetic groups and genetic communities from both MyHeritage and Ancestry DNA. These are the two companies that are offering us this kind of technology. So it's different, okay? So the matching technology at our DNA testing companies works like this. They see all of your DNA matches kind of in one big lump cluster. And then they begin to parse out the matches based on who is matching who. So with this technology, it's not, just not about you matching with these other people, but it's how these other people are all matching with each other in these really amazing networks. And by doing that, they can actually bring out 
smaller and smaller groups of people. They can see distinguishing features between groups of people in the database. Okay? So that's the science of it. It's, it's by understanding all of the relationships between all of the people in the database that they're able to pull out these smaller and smaller and smaller groups of people. Okay, now once they've done that, once they've found these genetically small-ish groups of people, they then apply a family tree. That's the bonus or the benefit of both my heritage and ancestry. They have a massive collection of family trees. So they can take the genetic information and they can lay genealogy information on top of it and give us some really amazing insight into who each of these groups are. Now, when I saw this happen for the first time, it was years ago when I was still part of the Sorensen Molecular Genealogy Foundation. And if you came to our 25th anniversary celebration yesterday, you heard Dr. Scott Woodward talk a little bit about this. But I was sitting in a conference room, and it was dark, and Scott put up some slides, and it was our early data. And in the early data, he had done just this. They had been able to pull out of our small little SMGF data set this groups of individuals. And he showed them on this screen. It was a blue screen with kind of these white clusters on it. And he said, look at this. We, we did it. We did what we thought we could do. We could genetically group people based on their matching similarities. And then he said, but that's not all. Because with the Sorensen Project, we collected family trees with every DNA sample. So we were able to go in to each cluster and see what is similar about the people in this cluster. Where is their common location? And we were, and the clusters that we were looking at were all of the, like, um, Tonga, Hawaii, the Philippines. And you could see so clearly these separate clusters from these separate island populations who are all related to each other. It was fascinating. And we were all so excited. It works, guys. And it continues to work for us now in these much, much larger data sets. So the thing is, when you zoom in to each of these clusters, you find within each cluster are even smaller clusters. So the more people that test, the easier it is for these companies to pull out these smaller clusters within a larger cluster. So let's say this larger cluster, when we look at the trees, we see everybody in this larger cluster is from Germany. But when we drill down and we pull out even smaller clusters, we can see even more definition that these people are from the area of Germany we call Saxony. And even better than that, there are four separate areas within that smaller area. It's amazing. I, can you guys feel how amazing this is? It's incredible. It's incredible that they can look at your DNA and tell you something as specific as you're from Saxony and Bavaria. These communities and groups are very accurate because of the way the technology works. Now, a big question I always get asked is, OK, but they're using family trees from ancestry and my heritage. Do they know how wrong they are? OK? And that's the thing, because there's so much data, the wrong answers fall out. Like, it's obvious these people are wrong, and they just, they fall out. They pull it out of the data set because it doesn't match, right? But we don't need everyone to have the right tree in order for this technology to work. That's the beauty of big data. Okay, so that's the science of DNA matching, of this kind of technology. It requires both the DNA matching and the family tree information in order for it to work. So how are we going to apply this technology to our own family history research? The principle here is that every genetic community or group that you see in your DNA test results has a home on your family tree. So you see how that's different than our then results, where you might get like 4% Middle East, and you might never find out where that goes on your family tree. But these communities and groups absolutely 
get a home on your family tree. So this is your homework, is to find them all, okay, and put them on your tree. So for my grandma, I have her here at my heritage, and remember I told you she was half Welsh and half Italian, and if we look at her results, if we kind of zoom in, the first thing you see here at the top I just wanted to mention, this is my heritage's kind of recall and precision for their then results. You can play with this little filter at the top, but this filter also affects the now results. It also affects the groups. So if you wanna see how confident my heritage is that you belong in a certain group, you need to move this lever all the way over to the left to the high. And that will tell you that they have high confidence that you're a part of one of these groups. Okay? So play with that little filter at the top to see, again, how confident they are that you are in these groups. But here for my grandma, you can see that she's got this, um, I want to read it so I don't get it wrong. That, so she's got the Welsh group right there under that Irish, Scottish, and Welsh. And then additional genetic groups you can see there underneath below. So if we look at these, you can see almost all of them are connected somehow to her Welsh family and community. Which tells us what? Well, number one, it tells us that probably my heritage has a better representation of people from Wales in their database than they do from Traversella, Italy, which is this little tiny town way up in the Alps. Which makes sense. Right? And so understanding again about your own populations and about who's likely to be tested, it definitely affects the results that you get. What's interesting though is that my grandma has this other population that says Northeastern and Midwestern USA. This is not in my grandma's family tree. Remember, her parents came essentially directly from their home countries to Washington State. Did not pass go, meaning they didn't cut through the Midwest, they didn't cut through the Northeast, they literally came from one country all the way to the other side of ours. So why does my grandma have these genetic group connections to the Northeastern United States and the Midwestern United States? And this is what's so cool about this technology. Her DNA is identifying her with that place, not because she's personally, or her family line is personally from that place, what it says is that people with her genetics are from those places, which means this is telling me about a migration pattern of her family, like, so her ancestors who had descendants who came through the Northeast and through the Midwest. So if I'm looking for other information about her ancestors and their descendants, I will find them in the Midwest and in the Northeast. So sometimes these reveal information not about our own personal lines migration patterns, but about the migration patterns of our larger family group, which is pretty cool. Okay, so no matter how, though, these communities and groups should have a place somewhere in your family tree. So if you click on that um, Northwestern and Midwestern group, you can see all these little um, splotches and dots from my heritage, which again is them trying to help us identify where these people were from and how they got here. They also have uh, top places that they came from. They have top surnames that you can look at. All things worth your time and worth exploring within this my heritage tool. There's a lot, a lot to look at here. This is just one more example from Ancestry. This is my mom's family. And again, what I want you to do is go through each of the communities that it's offered and check them off. Yep, I know where that one is. Yep, I know where that one is. So for my mom, I can get that Germans from Austria, Hungary, and the Don Step, as well as the Upper Midwest settlers. Those are checked off on my mom's direct maternal line. The thing is, my mom was adopted, and this paternal line is still a little bit of a mystery. We know quite a bit but not all that we want to know. But I know something. I know that people from this line are Alabama settlers, and they're from West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. So hints like that are incredibly useful. And even if you're not missing a biological parent, they're still useful for you. 
I did a coaching session once with a man who's missing a two times great grandfather. The guy just shows up in Ohio in like midlife. He's like 40. And he gets married and has some kids of which she's descended. But literally for the first 40 years of his life, they have no idea. So we look through his communities, and he has a community mapping to New Jersey. And I asked if he has any other ancestral lines from that area. He says, no, I've never even heard of that. That was really surprising. And I was like, that's where he's from. Really? And so now he has a name and a place that he can look in. Finally, a place to look for records for this guy. Okay, so pay close attention to these communities. They matter. So these communities can sometimes help you find best mystery matches. So last month in our study group, we had what we call a dive, where for members of our study group, I do like live coaching, and we just dive in and look at somebody's results. And so Danielle gave me permission to share this uh, with her because I thought this was so fascinating because this is a relatively new tool from Ancestry. So this is her research goal. You can see that blaring, empty spot in her family tree. The problem is these people were born outside the country, and it's just hard to find matches. They're just really small, and it was just difficult to sort them to find them. And so what we're able to do at Ancestry is they have a section now, um, Communities by Parent. And she was able to narrow down her communities by her father's side. And you can see here that there is a central Poland and central Poland, Poland and northwest Ukraine communities, which is where her family's from. So these DNA matches that are listed here as being part of that shared community become her best matches. If their DNA is pointing them to the same place that her DNA is pointing, and it could help her fill out this missing part of her family tree, this becomes a really powerful tool. Now, so far, these communities are only showing us like the first three matches, which for most of us are people we already know, which isn't very helpful. So if you happen to wander by the Ancestry booth, I think you should just mention to them that you would love to see more, because the more people that tell them, the more likely it is that they'll give us more people here. But it's a good start, and it's a good reminder that these communities are going to be powerful for us. Oh, sorry, wrong button. Okay, so that was our now, our now science and our now application. So I now wanna talk about soon, about the future, about what's coming. So with our ethnicity results, as I mentioned, we have come so far. We've come so far from being able to be 100% Europe to now having this genetic community from my mom that tells me the exact migration pattern of her maternal line from the Ukraine all the way to North Dakota. It's amazing and fascinating and beautiful and it will continue to improve. Recently, both my heritage and ancestry have updated their ethnicity results, adding many new groups and communities. And the more people that are tested, the more they'll be able to add. So really the best thing you can do to ensure your future success with your ethnicity results is test as many family members as you can. The more of your family's DNA is in the database, the better able these companies are going to be at telling you where you're from, gathering you into these communities, and able to help you move forward in your family history using this technology. I also think our side view technology from Ancestry DNA is really powerful. The ability that they have to separate your ethnicity into parent is groundbreaking. This is hard to do. And I don't think it will be very long before we'll be able to separate our ethnicity into our grandparents. And wouldn't that be amazing? So, we need, as I said yesterday, we need more really smart people to think about these problems. The data is there. There's so much data. We need statisticians and mathematicians and software engineers to take an interest in our cause and help get into this data and pull out these kinds of useful tidbits that are going to teach us more about where our family was from and when they were from there. But I think maybe even more important than that 
is what this technology can do for our future generations. So I had the opportunity to be part of a project headed up by Living DNA, one of our DNA testing companies. What we did is we took DNA test kits into a, a school in Atlanta, Georgia, an all-girls school, and we tested these girls on both their ethnicity results, and we also gave them their mitochondrial DNA. And mitochondrial DNA traces only their direct maternal line. So I was able to go to Georgia and to talk to these girls and to explain what these results meant and to help them understand what exactly we had done for them. So the way we broke it up is I, we identified groups of girls that shared similar, a similar population. I invited them to come and sit at a table together. And then I gave them their results and I told them, you are all have heritage from Tongo, for example. And they would look at their results and they would look around at each other. And one of the girls said, we're all sisters. Can you imagine a group of middle school girls sitting around a table with each other and recognizing for the first time that they weren't different? There was such a sense of awe and community and they were blown away by this knowledge that they were connected to each other. They had a common origin. They had a common family line. Their DNA was common to each other. I had another girl who said, I have to tell them, my family, that the color of your skin can't tell you where you're from. Think if every middle schooler understood this principle. Think how it would change how they see not just themselves, but their fellow classmates. Think how it would change the way they treat each other. Ethnicity results in this way because DNA has the power it does. And again, I don't know why. I don't know why we've let DNA be in charge of our identity. I don't know why we've given it that power. We have. We've decided we are who our DNA is. But we can harness that interest, that spark of DNA, especially in the younger generations, because it's cool, it's interesting, it's self. And we can help them see, yes, your DNA does represent who you are, and it connects you irrevocably to those around you and gives you that commonality, that origin that's so hard to see when you're a kid. You just see different, and you only want you. You want what's like you. So it is my like big dream that we'll be able to take this kind of program into many, many, many schools, and we'll be able to teach many, many middle school students that they are just like the person next to them and we should all treat each other with just a little more respect. So that's my hope for where the future of ethnicity testing will go, is to lead our younger generations to be more accepting of those around them. So what we've done already here in Roots Tech, yesterday we did our part one of You Can Do the DNA. This is part two. Part three is coming up later this afternoon, today at 1.30. We are gonna be talking about that DNA match list and how to analyze it, how to group it, what to do with it. So that's 1.30 right here in this room. Saturday, we'll do part four, and we're going to go through a real case study start to finish so you kind of understand the full process of what goes on here. And then, because I had too much to say, I know, surprising, right? I added another webinar this coming week on Thursday, so it'll be a free webinar. I just didn't feel like I could tackle two case studies in uh, part four, so I made it part five. So if you're interested, you can watch it from home. Of course, some of you are already at home. So March 7th at 2 p.m., you just need to go to our um, website and register so you get the link. And I found the feedback form, so this is in the app. So Roots Tech really appreciates it when you take their surveys so they know what content you like, what presenters you like. So if you go to the app, you click on Take Survey, it'll bring up the survey. And then I don't want you to have to think any more than you already are. It's just fives all the way down. Just, 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 you don't even have to read it, just fives. 
and then click submit, and that will help them know what it is that you do and don't like about the things you see here at Roots Tech. So this is the QR code to sign up for that webinar. I thought I'd put it up here in case you wanted it, but it's also at our booth if you want to make sure you get on that list so I can send you the link. But we do have about 10 minutes for questions if you would like to ask them. Um, just come right up here to the microphones. There's one on that aisle and one on this aisle. That way everyone can hear you. Go ahead, I think you turned it on. Okay. Yeah. Whoa, sorry. <laughs> um, so what do we do with the 1%? So good question. So part of what I do in, in the workbook I was telling you about is like it helps you combine all of your ethnicity percentages from all of the different companies kind of into one master list. And so for the 1%, I want to know, do you see it somewhere else? Is there a 1% in any other company you've tested at? If not, it's probably not something to really be concerned about. If you see it kind of consistently, then maybe it's something you need to look into. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's hear it. Okay, I have test well, I tested Ancestry uploaded to Family Tree DNA and my heritage. Ancestry shows me that I am 15% Swedish, Norwegian, Danish. My heritage shows me I am 35% from those three countries, and uh, Family Tree DNA said I am nada. <laughs> okay, now I understand now why there's no Lars Larsen in my documentary gene genealogy, and maybe I understand why Family Tree DNA doesn't have a Scandinavian background population, but I'm still kind of going 15%, 35%. I, you know, if they were closer, I'd go, eh. But they're not. <laughs> right. Okay. So she's got this range, 0 to 35% from this general Nordic area of the world, and she's trying to reconcile this. Okay. So a slide I didn't show you, but maybe should have, is that when they run your ethnicity results, they run it through their system like a thousand times. And every time they run it through the system, they get a different answer. That's the kind of math that this is. It doesn't make sense to us because we know that one plus one equals two every time. That's math, not this kind of math. Okay, so they run your same data through their same system a thousand times, and they get a different answer every time. What they report to you is the average of all of those runs, okay? And so the, the, the range of that might be 0 to 35%, and one company might be telling you that higher end, one is the very low end, and you got one kind of in the middle. So range is one idea, but why didn't they all average out to the same number at every company, right? That doesn't make sense. So as far as the 15 and 35% goes, I think a good explanation for that is the idea that where at Ancestry it's 15%, where's the other 20% gone, right? So you look at your full ethnicity results and ancestry, and you're like, okay, if I'm missing 10%, 20% of something, where'd they put it, right? And then you kind of start to see, oh, they put it in this nearby country, or they put it in this nearby region. And then we've got that situation with the Germans, right, that I showed you how sometimes they get recalled back to their home country and sometimes they don't and sometimes they get put in the wrong place but it's kind of nearby, okay? So look at it all around and likely you're gonna find where they put it. Yeah, Germany, yeah, right? Because it's like the broad category includes all those not really German countries but really close to German, sometimes it gets sucked into that Germany country. Okay, over here. So yesterday you um, talked about how uh, we should test with different companies or, or move our DNA over to them. And I'm looking, of course, at uh, a little bit of a, a brick wall uh, further back. I've got some brothers who've tested. And so I'm looking at doing a Y DNA test for my brother. Um, as I look at the different kinds of Y DNAs, if I understand today correctly then, 
the biggest DNA where they get the most markers is where I'm going to get my best results. Right, so, so why DNA doesn't give us these kinds of ethnicity results, it gives you one, it's called a haplogroup, right? But in general, I think with DNA and dessert, more is always better, right? More tests, always better. Okay, so at Family Tree DNA, who does the Y DNA testing, they have three slash four levels of testing. You can test at 37 markers, which are just locations on the DNA that are tested. You can test at 111 markers. You can test at big Y, which is like all the things. Or you can take like these other little things. Okay, so yes, dessert and DNA, big Y is the best. Okay, but it's expensive, right? And it's kind of like how much do you need to know to be successful in your research? So with Y-DNA, if you're just trying to figure out if you are or aren't related to someone else, 37 markers can probably tell you. That's all you want to know. But if you want to know about your relationship to five other men who are also related to your same line, and you want to figure out how far back your connection is, and you want to find that common ancestor, you're going to need big Y. So that's it. That was very helpful. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. I wanted to know, what is the best test for African Americans? I was told that one, two, three, and me was a good test to take. So I want to know, what's the best one for me to do? So we actually have an entire blog post on what is the best DNA test for African Americans. I'll summarize it for you. It is that 23andMe, my heritage and ancestry, are very similar in the reference populations that they're using for Africa in general. But if you know like a specific region of Africa that you are especially interested in, West Africa, South Africa, wherever, then you can look through the reference populations for each of those companies and see which one seems to resonate the most with what you believe your heritage is. And then you may want to test with that company. So all three of those companies are doing a good job of breaking up Africa into multiple pieces, but some are better than others in certain regions. So you'll want to just read through. And we have it in the blog post. And there's a link in the handout okay. that will take you to that as well. And so just kind of read through and see which one you think is going to match what you need. So I have no idea. Is that it? So okay. So, so then you, you have tested all of them. It's, yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay. thank you. And just by the way, the best way, if you weren't here yesterday, to test at all of them is if you test first at Ancestry, you spit in their tube, and then you transfer which means you download their data to your computer. You can upload it into MyHeritage for free. And then you pay a $29 unlock fee to get their ethnicity results. And then you'll be in both Ancestry and MyHeritage for you know, the price of an Ancestry kit plus $29. So that's the, that's the most efficient way. And then you have to physically test at 23 and me again. But you could get in those two for relatively inexpensively. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank you for your presentation. You are so clear. Oh, you know, you you thank you. You've you've made it very understandable. Good. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> my my um, <clears throat> question is: um, I followed your recommendation of trying to get as many family members to, to get their uh, DNA tested, and I now have. And we've gone through Ancestry.com, so we all have. We can I can access their information. I have six first cousins on my maternal side who have gathered, you have taken the test, and <clears throat> as you probably know, we're going to have a whole range mm -hmm. of percentage of estimated ethnicity. So my question is, how do you um, explain, for example, my indigenous heritage, which amongst my first cousin ranges from 27% to 42%. Mm. And, then, and that goes on for all the other estimated uh, ancestries that, that uh, were listed. First of all, amazing that you have that many first cousins tested. Way to go, you. It gives you such rich data, right? And, and it gives you this bigger, better picture of the full ethnicity. As she said, this range of indigenous populations from something in the 20s to something in the 40s really helps you understand the actual heritage of your ancestors. So the answer is that, you know, each of these first cousins only shares, say, 
700 centimorgans with each other, right? You just share a little bit of your DNA with each other. And so by combining your efforts, you've been able to create a really beautiful picture of your heritage. And, it, and it's not, there's no like definite way you can assign any kind of percentage to your ancestor necessarily without some more complicated math. But it does give you a really nice picture. So that 40% person, for example, if they don't have any other indigenous lines other than the one they share with you, then that 40% is good. And I'm done. That's it. Yep. Time.